Earlier in this unit, we talked about standing wave patterns, and how when standing wave patterns are created, they lead to something called resonance. We mainly focus, though, on strings and things that can create transverse standing wave patterns, but we have to remember that longitudinal waves, like sound waves, can also be set up in standing wave patterns. But when we draw out what the waveforms are doing, we still like to draw them as if those waves were transverse waves. But we can still try and represent what kinds of standing wave patterns we would see if we were dealing with resonating air, essentially a sound wave moving through air. So the focus of this note is air columns. So we imagine setting up something like a tube, like an organ pipe, or some kind of tubing that you might use for any kind of musical instrument. And we need to have one of the ends being open in all cases so that air can get in. But then we use terms like open end and closed end. So an open-ended pipe is one that's open at both ends, because obviously it needed to be open at one of the ends to let the air in. But when we say open end, we mean it's also open at the other end as well, so that the air can go back out. When we talk about closed end pipes, we mean, of course, they're open at one end so that air can come in, but they're also closed at the other end. And so the two little diagrams that I'm going to fill in in a second, you can see what that looks like. So the open end is just the top and bottom of the pipe, but it's open at both ends. And the closed end has the top and bottom, but it's closed off on the right side. Remember that a standing wave pattern we draw as a series of crests and the alternating crests that interact with that as well. So for example, if we've got an open end, what happens with an open end is that the air particles are free to move a far distance away from the rest position at the end. So what that means is that at the end points, we end up getting crests, and that happens at both ends in the open end situation. And so we just need to draw waveforms that have a crest at the beginning and a crest at the end. Or you could think of it as just an antinode at the beginning and an antinode at the end. Because some of those crests we could really think of as more like troughs. So I'm going to draw one pattern that looks something like that. And now I'll draw in another color the alternating waveform. And so you can see that we do have a crest at each end. That's what we get in the open-ended case. In the closed end, it's a little bit different. Because at the end, for example, this end on the right that's closed off, the air particles can't freely move. And so because it's closed off, it actually forces there to be a node at that closed end. And so we can draw what that would look like. It would start from the left with an open end, but then it would have to finish as a node. So I'm going to start it off as a crest, but it's going to finish as a node right in the middle, right in its rest position. And when I do the alternating waveform, and so the node ends up right at the end. Again, and it's a node because the air particles aren't able to move much from the rest position at all. And when particles don't move at all from the rest position, we call that a node. So in general, this is the principle that's used for any kind of wind instrument. Essentially, when you blow into a wind instrument, your mouth is creating lots of different kinds of vibrations. It's creating vibrations at lots of different frequencies. But only the vibrations that come out of your mouth at one specific frequency will happen to line up with just the right natural frequency of the tube of, that the sound is traveling through. And when your vibrations line up with that correct natural frequency, we get resonance in the pipe and we get massive amplification of those sound vibrations. That's why we hear a particular tone when we have a particular length of tubing. But we can see that the number of waveforms that we can fit inside is going to really depend on the length of our tubing. And so the diagrams below, we're going to go through what happens when only certain sizes of waveforms can fit 
into a certain length of tubing, and we'll talk about what kind of results we'll get in terms of our wavelength. So our goal in this chart is to try and draw as many different kinds of standing wave patterns that could fit into a certain length of tubing. And for starters, we're going to try and start with the most simple form of wave that we could create. So on the open side of our chart, we know that for an open end now, it needs to start and end on crests or antinodes. So the simplest possible way I could draw that would be to draw a waveform that looks something like this. And so you can see that it's really only a, a small part of an entire wavelength. It's definitely not an entire wave cycle. But I've still got wave formations. It's still in a wave pattern. And at both ends, I've got antinodes. So I've satisfied exactly what I know a standing wave in an open air column should look like. So that would actually be the simplest possible standing wave pattern that we could draw inside of an open air column. But then we can ask ourselves a few questions. We could say, for example, how many wavelengths are we actually covering here? So if I take a new color and I just follow through what's happening here, so if I just follow the blue wave, it goes through from the lowest point all the way up to the highest point, but then doesn't come all the way back down to the lowest point. That means it goes halfway through its wave cycle. So what we've actually drawn here is a standing wave pattern with only half of a lambda, half of a wavelength. And because that's the simplest possible standing wave pattern that we can draw, we call it the first harmonic. Harmonic is just a name for the different levels of standing wave patterns that can be set up. And the very first one, or the simplest one, we just call the first harmonic. And so we say that its harmonic number is 1, and then what we would say out loud is that it's the first harmonic. So a harmonic number of one just means it's the first harmonic. And really, that means it's the simplest possible wave pattern that we could draw that creates a standing wave in an open air column. But there's other waves that we could draw as well. So here's another wave pattern. This would be the next most complex. So let's say we're able to fit even more of a wave in here. Maybe not the entire waveform, but more of it. As long as we start and end on a crest, we know we've still satisfied our conditions. So what about if we had a wave that goes down and comes back up, something like that? And the alternating wave would do the exact opposite. It would go up and then come down, something like that. Well. In that case, then, we've actually done one whole wavelength. And so I'm just going to write lambda, because really it's one whole lambda that we've covered. That's how many wavelengths we've covered in this case. And it's the second simplest waveform that we could draw, or standing wave pattern that we could draw. And so its harmonic number is 2. Or in other words, we would call it the second harmonic. The next most complicated one I could draw that fits even a bit more of the wave in there is if I start up top, I go down, and then up, and then finish back down again. And then once again, I use my alternating color to do the exact opposite. Something like that. Now, if I go back and trace out my waveform again, I'll maybe just trace out the red waveform. So I go all the way down, come all the way back up. That's one wave cycle. And then I go all the way back down. So it's actually one and a half wave cycles. And I'm just going to write that as an improper fraction. It's like we have three halves, three over two lambdas, three halves of a wavelength. And we call that the harmonic number of three. What's nice is we can also use these harmonic numbers to give us a sense of a pattern. Because in our middle one that we said was one full wavelength, I could have actually written that as two halves of a wavelength. Because two halves is the same as one whole. And now you can see that the top of that fraction that's in front of lambda tells us the harmonic number. So the first harmonic 
is one half of a lambda, the second harmonic is two halves of a lambda, the third harmonic is three halves, and now you could probably guess what the fourth harmonic would be, even though we haven't drawn it. It's actually four halves of a lambda, or in other words, two full wavelengths. And so the harmonic number gives us a nice pattern that tells us how many wavelengths will fit inside of a given length of tubing that we're using. But so far, again, all of these are just open uh, tubing scenarios. So let's look at the other half of our chart for closed. So now we've got something that's closed at one end. And remember, our condition there is that at the closed end, we need to create a node. And so we start just like we did in the open side of things, where we try and create the simplest possible situation that we can that starts with an anti-node on the left side, because the left side is open, but ends on a node on the right side, because the right side is closed. Well, the simplest way we can do that is to just draw one that starts as a crest or anti-node and just ends right in the middle at its rest position. The alternating wave starts from the bottom but does a very similar thing. That would be the simplest possible waveform that we could draw that satisfies our condition, that we have anti-nodes anywhere that there's an open end and nodes anywhere that there's a closed end. But now if we ask ourselves how many wavelengths have we traveled through, well, it's not even actually a half of a wavelength in this case, because a half would be going from the highest point all the way down to the lowest point, for example, and we're just going from the highest point to the middle, the rest position. So really, that's actually one quarter of a wavelength, one quarter lambda. But we still say that its harmonic number is one. In other words, it's still called the first harmonic. But now let's try and draw a little bit more complex of a wave pattern. So I could have a waveform that starts at the bottom and goes up and then finishes in the middle. And then I would have an alternating wave that does the opposite, goes down and then comes up and finishes in the middle. Well, if I trace this out, maybe I'll trace out the red one, but I'll use my green marker to do it. I start from the bottom and I go up and that's a half of a wavelength. And then I go not all the way back down to the bottom. So I go up a half and then another quarter. So I actually go through three quarters of a wavelength, three quarters lambda. And for that, because we actually jump from one quarter to three quarters, because we're trying to link the harmonic number to a special pattern in the wavelengths, we actually call this the third harmonic, so that its harmonic number matches up with how many quarter wavelengths can fit inside of that tubing. So a harmonic number of one means that one quarter wavelength fits in. Harmonic number three means that three quarters fits in. So what's a little bit weird about closed and um, standing wave diagrams is that there actually is no second harmonic at all. We go right from the first harmonic to the third because of the way the fractions happen to work out. We can go one step further though and make one that's even a little bit uh, trickier. So what about if I start at the top and I go down and back up and then finish somewhere in the middle. And the alternating wave does the opposite. It goes up and then down and then finishes in the middle. So now I go through one full entire wavelength and then I go an extra quarter of a wavelength after. So that's like one full wavelength plus a quarter. As an improper fraction, we would say that that's five quarters. Because a whole is four quarters and then we add an extra quarter, so it's five quarters of a wavelength. And because of that, if you're following the pattern, you'd realize that that means our harmonic number will be five. So again, for closed end standing wave patterns, we actually don't talk about there being a second or a fourth or a sixth or any even numbered harmonics just because of the way the fractions work out. Because we want a way for that harmonic number to connect directly to the top number in our fraction of wavelengths. With all of this in mind, we could then extend this pattern much further, and that's what physicists did years ago. 
And eventually, if we take this pattern further and combine it with some things that we know about the universal wave equation, what we can do is arrive at not just an understanding of what the wavelengths are doing, but also try and understand how the frequencies are going to change when we go to higher and higher harmonic levels. When we use that pattern, and as I said, combine it with what we know about the universal wave equation that connects speed and frequency with wavelength as well, then we can take what we just learned about wavelength and how it changes with each harmonic number and apply that to frequencies and use that to figure out what we call the harmonic frequencies of a resonating tube or a resonating pipe. And that's going to be different in terms of whether it's an open-ended pipe or a closed-ended pipe. And so the formulas are almost identical whether it's open or closed. The only difference is that for open, we divide by 2 times the length of the pipe. For a closed-end situation, we divide by 4 times the length of the pipe that we're using. And that number 2 and that number 4 just come straight from the fact that the wave patterns happen to divide up either by half wavelengths, like they did for open ends, or by quarter wavelengths, like they did for closed ends. And so if we link that back to what we know about harmonic number, we can come up with frequency through the formula given here. So when we use n, that's just the harmonic number. And it's a unitless quantity. It's just telling us what level of harmonic we're at, based on what we just looked at in the previous chart. And then f with the little n beside it, is whatever frequency you would have at the nth harmonic. So if it was f with a little 1, it would be the first harmonic. If it was f with a little 2, we would call it the second harmonic, and so on. Then v is just the speed of sound, and l is what we use for the length of the piping. Now what we can also do is just double check that we are getting the correct units when we use a formula like this. Because in the end, we should be getting something that's a frequency. So it should be measured in hertz. So what I'm going to do now is focus on all the stuff on the right side of the equation and just try and demonstrate that it still would produce hertz. So we're taking that harmonic number n, but the units for that are unitless completely. So I'm going to put a spot for it, but then just put a little stroke through it because it's a unitless quantity. And then we've got velocity on top in meters per second. That's the speed of sound. And then we're dividing by the number 2, which doesn't have a unit at all, and then length, which we'll measure in meters. So anytime we use this formula and we use the length of the piping, we'll always keep it in meters. When that's the case, what ends up happening is that the meters from meters per second and the meters that we divide by for the length of the pipe, they cancel out completely. And so what we're left with is just a unit that has really no unit on top, so I'll just leave the number 1 there in its place, and then seconds on the bottom. So we end up with this unit that's 1 over seconds, or 1 divided by seconds, which is really exactly what we mean when we talk about hertz. That's what a hertz is. And so even though we're doing some weird things with velocity and the length of the pipe, when we divide it all out, it still produces something that's in hertz, the correct unit. In class, I'm going to go through these diagrams again in a bit more detail, and we'll take some time and see how we can actually solve problems using this formula. But you're welcome to try using the information that you see in the example below and taking a stab at finding those resonant frequencies yourself first.